Okay, welcome back everyone to uh, the round table on experimental uh, economics and what we have learned. Um, let me briefly introduce the issue and then introduce the, the, the speakers. So I guess for all of you who believe that uh, economics is a science, we adhere to the scientific method. And uh, basically what that means is that we generate knowledge based on empirical and measurable evidence, okay? And that's subject to some specific reason, whether, reasoning, whether it is this theory uh, uh, or certain, you know, concepts that we have in, in mind. Now, I think the scientific method speaks for itself. I, I like to think of uh, Richard Feynman, the physicist uh, way of describing the scientific method. We observe, we form a hypothesis, we test, and then, well, either we reject the hypothesis or we do not reject it. We cannot accept the hypothesis as being true because, you know, as happened with Newton's laws, for a long time people thought they were true and then it took a long time for people to find out they were actually were not true. So, you know, the only thing we can do is reject hypotheses, but we cannot really uh, necessarily f find the truth, which is, in a sense, you know, inherent in what uh, the knowledge acquisition is all about. Uh, so economics, I believe, adheres to a large extent to uh, the scientific method. There's, of course, non-experimental economics, the kind of the traditional way of using data. Um, I would like to, uh, this is out for, for debate, but I would like to make a distinction between the traditional economics and the experimental economics and the way the data is uh, collected. Of course, everyone has to collect data, right? You have, someone has to collect data, but there's a, a difference maybe with the experimental economics that the, the way data is collected with a purpose in mind rather than just, you know, collecting the data like a census bureau collects the data or a, or a survey is, is being collected because we treat the data, okay? We, uh, we, we affect what individuals uh, are subjected to in terms of their uh, treatment. So it's not necessarily about the data collection per se, but what we do uh, uh, with the people who are subject to the collection of the data. And of course, in the first category of using existing data, as I would, would say, there's a long tradition. I mean, we had uh, a, a talk from Amsterdam, I mean, the tradition of Timbergen and Koopmans of um, looking really for causal inference from existing data. The data was not uh, experimental in that sense. But, you know, you have to pass always, of course, the uh, test of is this causal or not, or the, you have to pass the endogeneity police. There was a couple of questions in the first talk, you know, uh, is what, uh, you know, is, is this identified? Is, uh, where, where's the issue of the uh, uh, endogeneity? Now, let me go to experimental economics and then say, well, you know, here we have done something to the data uh, specifically to think about, you know, what this causality may be, and we have kind of manipulated, if you want, uh, uh, the data. I would say, you know, this is researcher-generated data rather than just simply collected data. Um, I would make three broad categories, but, you know, you can disagree on this, uh, 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 of course. I would say on the one hand, we have lab experiments, so you do this in the lab. You have field experiments where you do this in a real-life setting, but in a kind of uh, controlled population. And I would call something like uh, more broadly program evaluation where you have some manipulation of the data, but it's really economy-wide. And I think then of programs like Progress in Mexico, which I think was one of the first one where they did this, which was very much, much motivated by uh, economists who were trying to have existing social programs, but they, the economists asked the, 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 the implementers of this to you know, run certain experiments, have sub population being subject to certain social programs and others to different ones, and this or a control group, and then this allowed people to infer causal um, uh, relations. Um, Scandinavian countries do this in the labor market, uh, have been doing this for a long time and, and are constantly uh, ex experimenting. Of course, in addition to these three categories, this is not just uh, the, 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 the domain of universities or of academics, it's also private companies do that. I mean, Facebook and Google do experimentation because they change what certain groups see and what other uh, uh, groups see. Um, so, you know, there's obviously many nice things, and one of the things I heard from all four is where is the debate going to be? You know, where is the conflict going to be in this round table? So um, uh, let's help me and try and get as much conflict in it, because otherwise it's not going to be interesting. Let me first say some of the nice things about uh, 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 kind of what we've achieved. Uh, one of them, I think, I mean, I'll give you my very personal um, uh, hit list, you know, in terms of experiments, the, the, the Bertram, Mill, and Nathan 
manipulations of the CVs and how much callbacks they get. I think this is beautiful field experiment. Um, Plots market experiments, you know, you have, uh, uh, Ramon was telling me how we used to do it in, in the Balmes building when it, Pompeo just uh, started. You have a lot of chaos and the price comes out, price and quantity at the equilibrium, price and quantity. It, it, I think this is uh, beautiful. Uh, failure of Nash equilibrium in a dictatorship or a uh, game, but then if you give people you know, some work to do before they have to stuff envelopes. Well, the equilibrium changes completely because then they think of this giving something away as very different because they've worked for it. And why, why would I give this to you as opposed to, oh, you know, I got these $20. I can share it with you. No, no, I've worked for these $20. And then my behavior is very different uh, in that sense. So I think this is also interesting to see how strategies depend on, on you know, the, the kind of the history of how, how the, 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 the money was earned. So these are my kind of personal favorites. I'm sure that many people have many uh, different favorites. Let me now also talk a little bit about some of the challenges. Um, economics is very much also about you know, aggregate outcomes. And some of the criticism we tend to hear about experiments often is that you know, how much of this goes at the aggregate level. I mean, you know, what are the general equilibrium implications? And I guess there the criticism is that, well, if you do it in the lab, of course, it's very hard to get always at these general equilibrium effects. I mean, you can do it very uh, uh, locally. Or the criticism of some of the field experiments, for example, the debate in the World Bank about, um, you know, are, are microcredits, are they good? Because we don't really know what the aggregate effect is. And so let me cite a recent study done in Scandinavia and in Denmark, where they looked at, uh, at giving incentives. This is more closely to, to my own research, giving incentives to people to search in the labor market. And what they find is it has huge effect on the chances for people to find jobs when they get these incentives. But if they look economy-wide, the population that was not incentivized had actually a drop in the chance of finding uh, jobs. And so now there's an equilibrium effect because obviously it depends on how many vacancies are being created and you, you know, have a positive effect on a, on a subgroup and the net effect was actually zero because there was also this negative effect um, uh, on the other group. And so these are the kind of general equilibrium effects, of course, that I think uh, uh, remain a challenge for much of the uh, experimental work. Uh, so I hope that people will attack that issue also in what's to come. Uh, my idea of the talk would be, you know, what we have learned, but also what is there to be done, and I'm sure that the speakers will talk about this. So who are speakers? We have, um, I would say, on this side, two of the uh, early movers, including uh, Ramon, because he has done experiments also a long time ago. But I would start with Jordi and uh, uh, Rosie, who have you know, been uh, doing experiments and exclusively experiments, I would say, for, for a long time. They're, they've been uh, in the Barcelona GSE community from long before GSE existed. Um, and then we have uh, Ramon, I would you know, classify as more as a traditional macroeconomist, although he has done uh, experiments on, uh, um, on macro issues uh, and, and learning. And uh, finally, while well, we have the honor of having the president of the Econometric Society and one of the big supporters of the GSE, uh, Manuel Ariano, who's, I would call, an econometrician, so maybe more in the traditional camp of uh, looking at uh, data that is not manipulated as I defined earlier. So this is as much as I can say. Let's hope that there's going to be a lot of conflict and uh, little agreement. So uh, let's start with Jordi first. No, no, Ramon. No, oh, sorry, sorry. No, Ramon. Ramon first. <laughs> we need to start with the tradition. Uh, this is a round table, so I'm going to stand up. <laughs> Thing so yeah, the thing we want to talk about. Good. What can we learn? And that's pretty much what you were saying. We have science and engineering, and <laughs> everyone has scientists walls to understand, and engineers solve problems. Okay. And we provide science foundation to engineers, and they provide new challenges and new questions. And this happens in any science, natural science with engineers, life science with uh, medicine and bioengineering, and social science with policies. Based on experimentation. And of course, people say those were real science and put a question mark. <laughs> Why the hell we have a Nobel Prize, for example, okay? Uh, 
But here it comes, lab and natural experiments. So now we have real experiments. So we can talk the eye to the other scientists. So that's pretty much uh, what the engineers do, no? So what this causality in science is about engineering control. You have inputs, a control, and an output. And social science, we have agent decisions, policies, and social outcomes. That looks pretty much the same thing. Here is natural experiments. <coughs> I'll put natural experiments, what both of you mentioned. I think it's once different type of experiments have different comparative advantages. So you just have a policy, or you have placebo. And that's it, you play with it and see what happens with that. So now in macro, we could do the same thing. We have individual actions, people make decisions, these little A's, no? your assets or whatever. Then we have policies, and we got an output. Policies affect the aggregates, which is the capitals, A's. And we go from one state, A, little A, big, and S, which is exogenous state, to A prime, and it's primes. So, but this, when agents make decisions here, the households about savings and leisure and all that stuff, they have to have a perceived low motion about how the economy works. You have to have a perception about the interest rates, whether you buy a house or not. Okay? That's part of it. But that's exactly where we stand apart from all the signs. Because before it was clear, you put some inputs and policies, and this is like this always from the past to the future in causality and in control. But now we have this feedback effect of expectations. Okay? And agents are not stupid. Sometimes they think, well, is this a policy or just a placebo? They're talking about things, but maybe they don't do them. And of course, that will affect what we decide and even the effect of the policies. <coughs> so my, the reason I got involved with doing experiments is because I think that's exactly where lab experiments come in to understand much better this stuff, okay? And there are good reasons that it's gonna be difficult to do it with traditional econometrics or with other things, okay? So, oh, I had need to do with this. Sorry? <coughs> okay, that's okay, I think it's clear now. You are experimenting, yes? <laughs> so that's the whole idea. We go from the perceived low motion to the actual low motion. Learning is exactly about that. Learning theory is about understanding more this uh, move from what people perceive to what we do. When in our case, it then is this aggregation element that we're talking. So we can we have used learning theory, and this call it stability. I'm not going to talk about that, but just for you to know, as a way to have. In many cases, we have many equilibria in our models. Okay. So one of typical, which I worked a long time ago was this, I mean, you can think of money, we're holding money, fiat money, because we have the perception we'll have some value tomorrow, otherwise we will not have it, okay? But that, if you had to work through these models, typically generally we have many rational expectations, and particularly, so it's like a typical economy where the government finances some expenditures printing money, and we'll have like a steady state, this inflation today, inflation tomorrow, Another steady state which is high, but many, we call continual paths going up there. So that was sort of puzzling because we liked our theories to be, have predictable power. Here says all kinds of things can happen. Actually, very counterintuitive things can happen, which I'm not gonna have time to explain. But learning theory goes the other way around. It's like the mirror. Then you have paths that will go down here. Albert Marcel, Wisdom, Sardin, work on it, for example. But then the question is, how we tell those things apart? Okay. Well, I did a lot of experiments with Sam Sander, and here they are. They're always here. Never one of these things. This is normalized over a lot of experiments. Always here. But then, of course, you can use this, that not only to understand where we can, which kind of equilibrium are more learnable, are more likely to happen, but also then to design policies. For example, since here the problem was they had inflation because we had seniorage. 
Okay, one thing sometimes we recommend is that you reduce the signatures, as we do with the ECB. Then this clearly will go down. Actually, that one will go up, like this goes like this. Or some people recommend, like here in Europe, that you constrain the ECB from using signatures. So you put some fiscal constraints on the deficits and so on. <coughs> well, in this world, if you were to put, so you want to see learning can help you with policy design. So it is with George Evans and so. So if we do the rational expectations, the things go even worse. I mean, it just, you know, spend too much time. But the whole thing is that it doesn't make any sense to impose a fiscal constraint in this world in the rational expectations equilibria model. However, it's just the other way around with adaptive expectations. Adaptive expectations mean people just look at the past to figure out the future. Okay? Expectations. And then we can just do this in the experiment. And this is going through the experiment. Uh, we target and we just go there. So we just go exactly where we want by reducing slightly the making it tighter the constraint on the deficit. Okay? So that's exactly the case where the fiscal policy works. So we can figure out that one in the experiment in the lab. Difficult to do it's other plans. Well, then what about other strange things like sunspots, things that have nothing to do with reality having an effect. People worry a lot about that. And actually, you can even show that that might be learnable. So that's a lot of the worry. Because some strange things happen very nonlinear here. But we put it in the lab. We never saw that. Not out of the blue. Because it requires people coordinating beliefs about some kind of sunspot. We don't see that. However, then we just did something else, which is the very Pavlovian stuff. <coughs> so what we did is have a real effect. So it was a shock that happened at one odd periods, even periods. Different shock. People didn't see that. But they saw the flashing lights, as they said before. But now they maybe figured out that flashing lights said something. Because we stopped the shock, the real shock, and then this sort of continues. That happens here, that happens here, and so on. So, what's the bottom line here? We don't see these effects, except that the people had to expose. So that tells you that sometimes you do the same policy in different countries. It's very different if people had the common experience of living in Argentina with very high inflations than not. A regression will tell that those countries are using very different policies. It's the same policy. But we have these different feedback effects, okay? So that's an example where there was nothing, put the shock, and then we're just gone. So uh, people have looked at that, trying to get to this type of effects. Uh, this is a recent paper. So this is a model where you have the productivity is like have multiple equilibria, all rank, because your productivity depends on the other firm's level of employment. So you can have, you can just put it up in a model where you have equilibrium where you can have high level of employment, low level of employment, and something in between. And then they make the announcement, simply say, we think it's going to be high employment, which is just an announcement, it has nothing. And sometimes people coordinate, okay, it takes a while, sometimes people coordinate, sometimes they do a good job. That's, so it's like the high employment, low employment, but other times nothing. People just realize that it's more important what the other guys are doing rather than this guy babbling about being high or low. So that's the case. Okay. But I think more interesting probably than this is to understand one is likely to more learn, easy and easier to learn and faster. So a canonical model we use a lot in learning is a model that looks like this, the price of today depends on the expectations of the price people had. That's a linear one. So that's, uh, so, so if we put the B between zero and one, this is the so-called Lucas asset pricing model. Because the price of today of the asset depends on how much you think you're gonna be selling it tomorrow. But, and that's how all the learning literature started in economics, it started in agricultural economics. In agricultural economics happens that you have to figure out what you think the price is going to be before you decide what to plant and how much to plant. But once you have planned, you are stuck. 
But this means that the B is negative. Because if you thought that the price was going to be very high, and then they just will go the other way. So, but anyway, so you just have on one rational expectations. It doesn't matter. The rational expectations is the star. It doesn't matter whether it's one model or the other. It's the same thing. Okay. So here we might have some perception. This will be the actual low motion. So as we move from the perception, let's say that we think that the price is going to be better, to the actual low motion. And there's this mapping, and that's how we talk about this stability I mentioned before. You only need this V to be negative. Excuse me, less than one. So the the ratio be. And that's it. That's in both models. That's true for the asset pricing or for the cowboy model. So that's good. That's both learning. But they have different properties. One is positive feedback. The other is negative feedback. So here is an interesting experiment that those guys have done recently. So they do the same model, and now what they're going to change is the fundamental price. Okay. So it's going to be an unexpected change. And see what happens. Well, this is it. This is when you change with positive feedback. This is when you change with negative feedback. They learn eventually because we knew that it was learnable, but it takes a while with positive feedback. Okay? Because everyone is moving it's just in the same direction. Instead, you get crashed when it's negative feedback and you learn immediately. You get burned. Okay? Well, this has implications because Okay, this is like comparing again and so on. This is the price dividend ratio in US. That's the asset pricing. So we expect here exactly to have this positive feedback. Yes, so we can just then use learning theory to look at that. And that's a recent paper by Albert and, uh, what is Albert? Jesus, not here. We mark. OK? So, so here they had just simulated a more sophisticated learning model to do exactly that. But what is behind this sophisticated model of Klaus and Albert and Johannes is exactly that positive effect. And that's when we understand this is in the lab, not in the computer. But you need a computer to do that and the model. So use the lab to study feedback mechanisms not to validate models. There are a lot of papers trying to say they think that the task of the, okay, that's my clear position that they do. What do we do in the lab? Oh, I look, the new Keynesian model, I put it in the lab, or the new, I put it in the lab and see, no, waste of time. However, to understand basic mechanisms, that's very important. And that's where the comparative advantage is, okay? So, that's it. I think we understand incentives, we understand general equilibrium, we understand mechanisms and contract designs. We have to better understand perceptions <coughs> and these feedback effects. For this, the lab can help. This is true in the macro, it's true in the real life too. I look at the newspapers, made me think about this book by a psychologist. Thank you, Ramon. Any questions, remarks? OK, so um, I'm going to try to stand here so that I can use this microphone. So, uh, so thanks for inviting me to this uh, talk. Um, of course, it's kind of a demanding question, what have we learned? Because uh, I don't really know what collectively we have learned. I guess I know a little bit of what I have learned. And uh, so this. Talk, my talk will be a little bit less systematic than, than uh, Ramon's. I will talk a bit about a number, various things. Okay, so uh, what is experimental economics? So you, you know some of this, but let me just uh, use it to introduce it. It's mostly a method, right? So theoretical modeling is a method. Uh, use of econometrics to study observational data is a method. And experiments is just another method. Um, and like the other methods, it has been used to study all kinds of issues all kinds of issues. Um, and, and you can just go out there and read the, the, the journals and you'll see there's a lot of work on all kinds of things, on many topics, some of which you have, would never have thought uh, that one could do an experiment and or may not be even interested. 
And so I, the last thing I wrote on this is some, something that uh, maybe is not so obvious to everybody, but somehow experimental economics now has a life of its own. So it was a method to do things. It was, of course, therefore related to theory a lot, less so to the uh, study of data, but it was a lot related to theory, but now it, it really has sometimes a lot to do with theory, other times it doesn't have much to do with theory. It has devel developed their own dynamics. Some of those things are less attractive to many economists, but others are still quite central. Okay, so how are the topics that people study selected? Right? How do you ch choose something? So I guess uh, a lot of people like me, we, you know, you, we use a kind of guerrilla war approach to this, so you just go you just have some ideas of things that you're interested in and you try to work on those, but maybe something different comes up that you think is interesting, you have, that you had not worked before on, and that you can do something on it. And, ex and with experiments, you can actually relatively easy get into some topic. It's, much, it's, it's somehow easier than to do it with the other methods. Now, how do our topics selected? So here are some typical t ways. I don't know if maybe I should stand like this. Yeah. So one is in relation to theory. And theory, usually economic theory, but it can also be, I don't know, some things from biology or from sociology, those things can, can be a uh, starting point. Or very often it's, of course, economic theory. Um, another way it can start is to find out about kind of a theoretical issue of interest. And I'll give an example. So that's something that's not, theory doesn't really say anything about. And so you can, but you can study in the lab because the lab idea and actually the field is just that you have a method to generate data and then you can just basically study those data and talk about this. And whether it's based on theory is secondary in a way. You can also do an, ex an experimental case study, which is a, is a bit like something like uh, study, a, a good example is a market, which is uh, something you're interested in and which can be modeled by the use of some theories, but which uh, may be interesting beyond the theory. It's just an interesting market to study. So then what you study, you could say, is not really the, the model of this market, but you study this market using models, which is not the same, you will see. Um, and you can also study things that are hard to theorize. So it may be something that you don't know how to model, right? But you can easily just invent an experiment where there are some agents who do things and there's some interaction mechanism and, and you can just do that and look at it, right? So these are how many topics are selected. These are some ways in which topics are selected. Now, let me be a bit uh, self-serving here and use the opportunity to go some of the things that I've done and it helps also a bit to relate to what I just said. So the first, does this work? Yeah, doesn't matter. The first thing on the table, uh, on the screen is this paper on pivotal suppliers and market power in experimental supply function competition. So what is this? Well, is this is a study of a market which is really supposed to be like an electricity market. And the issue is to see the influence of pivotal suppliers. Now, what is a pivotal supplier? Is a company that if it takes away all its uh, capacity from the market, the rest of the suppliers cannot serve the demand, right? And this is a thing that practitioners have studied, right? You don't need to, you don't need theory to worry about pivotal suppliers. You can actually just invent, and people have done that, an, in, uh, an index of pivotal of pivotalness or of pivotal suppliers, and then you can just study it completely empirically by, by looking at whether prices in some electricity markets are higher when, the, uh, this, when this index is higher, right? But there are also theories about this. There's actually two models. One is a auction model, the other is the supply function equilibrium model. So what we do here is we just represent a market uh, in which, uh, which is a bit like the electricity market. There's pivotal, there are pivotal suppliers. You can look at it completely descriptively, but you, there are also two models which predict different things. And what you do then is you just look at what happens and you relate it to the equilibrium, to the equilibrium of the models. And you also discuss the relation of the data with uh, the, the results in the, in the field with this uh, empirical measure with the index, right? So is this, a, is this a test of theory? No, it's not a test of theory. It's more like the study of a market. And in this case, you actually use theoretical models to understand some of the things. You could do it with the, without the models, but of course, it's always poorer. But in this case, we can do it with it, right? So the second uh, thing on the, on the, on the, 
uh, screen is the impact of advice on women's and men's entry into competition. And this, this is kind of a, a thing that came out, or this is a line of research into we've, to which we have done something uh, that came out of experimental economics. And that is the possibility to check in the lab what the attitude of men and women is towards competition. And there are some really uh, very influential papers that fundament that most importantly show that women tend to shy away from competition. So there's a, think of it, there's a kind of task and you can do the task being paid piece rate, you can be, you can do, do the task under tournament incentives. And if you just have men and women in these situations, men and women do as just as well whether it's paid, paid piece rate or whether it's paid uh, tournament-wise. But if, on the other hand, you just let women choose whether they want to choose, whether they want to go, is this too, uh, bad? So, so okay. I have to run this. Sorry, I'm for four. Like this? Okay. So if you, if you, on the other hand, let women choose whether they want to uh, use, be paid by piece rate or paid by tournament incentives, women and actually that's the important thing. Capable women, women who are good at the task, tend to shy away from it and, and choose peace rate, although they would be earning more if they went into the tournament, right? So this is actually a discovery that is atheoretical. There's no theory about this. Maybe you can invoke some evolutionary biology, right? Men are selected to compete, maybe, you know? I don't know. Uh, but there's no theory in the sense that economists think of it. But it evolved out of experimental economics, and then we just did one experiment which uh, checks whether advice giving whether checks whether advice giving to women can actually correct for this. And there's other ways to correct for this. And since I may be uh, talking too much, the, the two, two second, uh, third and fourth paper do something, uh, what it, they have in common is something that I think is also a special thing of uh, lab experiments, and that is that they uh, involve the study of communication. If you think of it in, in economic theory, communication is not very prominent. There are, of course, game theoretic models involving communication, right? But it, it's communication in a very, very specific way. It's strategic communication. It's the effect of what that could be on the, on the interaction of players in a game theoretic uh, context. And, of course, that's an important case. But communication actually takes place all the time in the economy, in the society, about whatever, about all kinds of things. Now, the lab, and in this case the field, I think a little bit less, is a way in which you can study this systematically because you can have interaction of different types allowing for communication and without allowing for com communication. And you can actually then also study the communication that takes place and you can try to figure out which kind of, which kind of communication policy or which kind of things you, that you say have this or this other effect, right? So these are examples, right? And I guess I wanted to give them a part from you uh, telling you that we do this is also to give you a feel for the fact that we do quite different things, right? And, and some of this is connected to theory quite strongly. Others is not at all, right? Now, uh, the advantage of using experiments is something that I may go quickly because this is like a bit like something we'll repeat all the time, so you may know this. So control, uh, you know what are the conditions under which th uh, interaction takes place. You don't know it 100%, right? But you know, because you don't know what's in the head of people, but you know, quite, you know more than in other contexts, than in, con in non-experimental contexts. Replication, you can redo it. Actually, a lot of, uh, the, a lot of the uh, controversies and experimental uh, work is, are settled by replication or non-replication. They're not settled by redoing the analysis uh, and saying, oh, the analysis was not correct, now I did it better. That it also happens, so there are cases where this has happened. But most often, is if you have a result that sounds interesting but strange, then I can just go and do it again, and that's how it's often done, right? Replication uh, is important, and let me just say something here. Lab is easy to replicate, field is hard to replicate, right? If somebody did an experiment in Kenya financed by the World Bank, and I don't believe it, there's not much I can do, right? Because I cannot go myself there because I don't have the finance, right? On the other hand, lab experiments are cheaper, so it's easier to do. Causality, well, we, we like to insist that different treatments are introduced exogenously, which is something that is so 
to inf to imp um, you know causality without experimental control is much harder. Now we are also aware that the econometricians have very smart ways of getting at trying to figure out causality. So we're not claiming that uh, we only we do it better than anybody, but it is something we can do. And I think the last thing is highly interdisciplinary. Maybe I'll leave this for discussion later. We, we have probably more relation to uh, psychologists and uh, sociologists and people like this than uh, theoretical economists. Okay, oh, I should have done this bigger, but... So... <laughs> this, one minute, okay. I did this slide with Rosie, uh, the, uh, and then I edited it a bit. Uh, so, frequently asked questions and criticisms. Well, uh, there are some famous ones, and maybe let me go to the famous ones. One is, of course, the subject pool critique, right? So we do student, we use student subjects almost always, right? Uh, now, what can we say about this? Well, first, um, it's just not so easy to have other student subjects, other subjects. We have done recently an experiment on electricity and we have had the possibility to go to the market in Madrid, the Iberian market. But then you get into something which, of course, the people who always suggest you should get experts don't think about, which is sample size. So you say, I, I want some subjects to, who are experts in the market. Can you get them to me? They say, yeah, sure, we can. And then they get you 10. Right? And that's fine, you have then 10 experts, but somehow statistically you cannot do much with it. It's basically descriptive and it's interesting to do. But, so that's one thing I wanted to say about this. The other is, of course, that whether experts do better than students or different than students is an empirical question. And I think this should, I mean, this is really like a message, right? It is a good, it is a very natural objection, but we have to check it out whether it's true. And actually, there's the survey by Colin Kammer where he, um, uh, no, sorry, by Frechette, where he took, where he looks at all the experiments that have been done both with students and with, uh, with experts. And of course, there's all kinds of cases, right? But overall, the message seems to be there are no such big differences. Now, why this is a mystery that we can really discuss. The other is, uh, let me just mention that, field experiments versus labs. So field is very popular, uh, last thing, huh? field is very popular, and you know, I also want to go to Kenya or some, one of these places if possible. But uh, of course, uh, there, are, uh, there are problems of control, of financing, so I don't know, the lab has some advantages. And now the most important message about this, again, whether the field will yield different results than the lab is an empirical question. It sounds very intuitive. It will be different, but we have to check it out, and we don't know. And Kammer has a survey where he looks at all the experiments where you have really done the same in the field in the lab, and the differences are not so big, right? So uh, I guess uh, the field versus the lab should not be a, con should not be a war, but should be a, a uh, a cooperation is a two different ways of doing things. Sometimes one thing is the better, sometimes the other. So, you know, let's cooperate, but let's not just try to drive others out, like sometimes this uh, uh, may, may seem to be happening. So, um, yeah, so that maybe I, I just answer, I just finish with I, what I have at the end. The list is longer. I, I don't have time to go into more. There are more objections than the ones that I just brought up, and maybe we can discuss them later. But I think uh, one should see them as concerns that are important, and I mean, say that the experimentalists are aware of this. But you shouldn't see them as killer objections, like you say, oh, it's not with experts, so I don't want to look at it. I, that, I think, is not rational, really. Uh, so the relevance of, of many of these uh, objections is an empirical matter. One has to check it out. It makes sense, but maybe it's not true. So. And I have more stuff, but maybe we can discuss later. Okay, thank you, Jody. Uh, so on the note that uh, labs and fields should make love, not war, we're going to have now uh, uh, Rosie. I belong to the cohort, uh, the first cohort of um, PhD students who actually became experimenters. All the people before us who are, uh, came into experiments were theorists, like Jody was a theorist, I and mean, he did a thesis on theorists. And so when I did... When I did a, uh, my thesis, I started, it was like, where can you find a job? Yeah, I mean, it was really, 
there are no jobs. I mean, are you crazy to do just experiments? I actually tried also theory and was not very successful, but I'm now doing my first theory paper. Um, so, I mean, you're sitting here and you're all thinking, well, experiments are nice, but this might be our virus, yeah? So, um, it is not the case that all people in the world, all economists think that experiments are valuable, especially lab experiments are valuable. Yeah, so um, this is a false consensus if you think experiments are valuable. Yeah, um, so this fight or this thought for a PhD student, should I become a theorist or should I become an experimenter, is actually a very old question and a very old fight. Confucius, uh, 2,500 years ago, there must have been the same problem. I mean, there were people who were just thinking, reflecting, philosophizing, and they wanted to change the world. They wanted to create institutions, and they clearly thought that they were better. Then where there were people who were just looking and counting, counting with stones maybe. They had not much paper, so it was really difficult to count and make observations. So Confucius said, let's bring that all together, and he said, there are three ways to wisdom. First, by reflection, which is noblest, we all agree. Second, by imitation, which is easiest. And third, by experience, which is bitterest. And this is really true. If you get data, it's pretty bitter to see what's going on, especially if people are not rational in our sense. So, but you can choose, basically. As a PhD student, you can choose the first, the third. A second, well, maybe you should not be a th researcher. <laughs> um, I mean, <laughs> so the second uh, you basically do as an undergrad. Um, but then, so these people, they said, well, I'm one or the other. But then uh, Confucius also said, learning without thinking is useless, and thinking without learning is dangerous. So if we replace thinking by theory and learning by experiments, we understand it a little bit better. And um, yeah, so Confucius had, uh, the people then had big problems because they had no paper probably, they had definitely no computers, but they already had the same problem. Yeah, I mean, you could have thought reflection is a little bit easier and we, they wanted just to reflect. And most of the literature we get from them, I think is mainly reflection, 500 years, like. Platon and etc. Um, so, what is the big advancement in experimental economics? And that's not a joke now. Um, it's actually the computer. Yeah, if somebody comes to us and says, well, you have done this one period, why don't you do 100 periods? I mean, to do the 100 periods without computers is quite difficult. I mean, we can do 10 periods with paper and pencil. Um, this is difficult. And actually, when I did my thesis, Programming lab experiments was really difficult. So it took mostly two years, and I thought, I'm not going to program two years, and I still can't program. So I didn't program, and I did my experiments with pencil and paper. Um, so basically, these advancements, internet, new tools like mouse labs, clicking choices, uh, we get into cognitive processes, we can do lots of uh, ex um, uh, rounds, we can get subjects from all over the world uh, at the same time. All this has really, in the last two decades only, advanced very much experimental economics. Now I, I show you new fields. Field experiments is only since 1997, more or less. Neuroeconomics, basically 10 years. And this is, I mean, that was really a surprise that suddenly we want to look in the brain. Yeah, I mean, who's interested in the brain? Who's interested in processes? Um, economists were basically only interested in outcomes. And it is, this is one big fight, yeah. Should we be interested in blood pressure, uh, and should we be interested in children, should be interested, we should only be interested in experts who are rational, yeah? Um, so gender is another field that was only recently founded. Of course, we have great advances uh, in institutional design, the FCC auction. So when Christopher Sims was here, he said, oh, experiments are great for that, but otherwise we have no money. NSF has no money for other research and experiments. It might be cheap, but the cost-benefit relationship is not that high. Um, recently, um, I've tried with my friends, John Duffy and Frank Heinemann, to also enter fields which are still very critical. 
um, that is macroeconomics, finance, banking, and international trade. So one of our colleagues said, but isn't it great experimental economics also for macro? That was a macroeconomist from UPF. I said, well, um, I think you got the virus, but the virus in other macro departments is not there yet. Uh, and they are very critical and rightfully maybe critical. Um, so there are new descriptive models since 20 years. Um, Ramon has talked about learning. I will show you, if I have time, about cognition. Um, and uh, Jordi has already said it's highly interdisciplinary, so I have subjects now which are chimpanzees. Um, and we also look at people with um, brain lesions. Um, so these are clearly far away from experts in the usual sense, but uh, we can also learn something from them. So now I give you, I mean, I could ask you what's your question and maybe I can make up quickly an experiment, but this takes time, usually two, three years. Uh, so um, I will ask you my question. What is boundary rationality? Yeah, so I will give you a mini tour through experimental economics, touching um, field experiments, lab experiments, and neuroeconomics. Um, so first we need to find a good game, and I will show you a good game. And then, then we do a variation, so we um, might say two people or ten people or a thousand people, or we shock the people. Here we shock people, not the matrix, uh, as we heard in the first talk. And um, so we asked which equilibrium is selected, and then we can look really at deeply what is the boundary rationality. So the um, work I take is, um, you might be familiar, so you choose a number, the numbers are select all collected, you take the average and two six times the average, and you have to, have to be closest to that, and the closer you are, the higher your payoff. This has nice equilibrium structure. It's a unique equilibrium, which is Pareto optimal. So you would ask, why should we do such a silly experiment? I mean, it's a great equilibrium, we should I mean, everybody should play it. But unfortunately, people don't play it. And can you say more than they don't play it? So here I show you various treatments. So these are six different, different populations. The first one is the lab. Then we have theorists and the field newspapers. And you see clearly the equilibrium is chosen very differently. The average can be 35, 20, um, or 30, so very different. So this is quite dramatic. How can you make prediction in such games? And you might think this game is pretty silly. However, it's like a string in all Ramon's uh, experiments, so it's everything about expectation. I mean, economics is basically this game. You have to think what the others are doing, and if there's one, more than one player, you might need to aggregate um, um, all the players' behavior and then see uh, think what they are doing, and that's a big problem. I mean, you think about them, something you have no clue, you have no anchor, yeah, and well, that's the mess you get as an outcome. So you will say, no possibility. No, but if you have taught it, you know, if you play it your, against your undergrads, you know which number you should choose, namely more or less 22. Now, let's go to the field and do the same experiment to the field in the newspaper. So we announced it in the newspaper, Anthony. Um, and here we have three newspapers, so on the left, on the right, and down on the right, uh, Expansion also, and you see, well, my, maybe you don't see it, but the average is based, uh, the winning number is 13, 14, 16, so pretty close. So we can do predictions if we know the subject pool. Yeah, but this is a problem, not always you know the subject pool. Yeah, but we have to think, I mean, especially macroeconomists too, to policy uh, implications, and this is all based on equilibrium, but maybe you are not in equilibrium. So maybe your policy fails. It's bad when you, uh, people are not in equilibrium because then you can trick the system. You can be better than the others. You can get higher weights. So can we at least, uh, so let's describe the behavior. We can, we see a clear structure. And this is a so-called level uh, K model, and Keynes already introduced it, and if you can't read Keynes, maybe you can read it at home. Uh, the beauty contest is actually due to Keynes. So, I mean, you don't know what to do in this game. You choose a random number, the average will be 50, two thirds of that is 30, so you see clearly a spike at 30. And, let's see, no, I didn't try that out. <laughs> um, well, it's at 30 at, um, 22, and then a spike at um, zero. So we see patterns. 
Yeah? And this model, actually, this level K model, um, gives us a lot of explanations also in many other um, papers in other games where behavior is far out of equilibrium. So people have some naive idea about what's the right answer and they give best reply and then they stop. Well, maybe some others are better and they don't stop and go on. Well, the, uh, under common knowledge of rationality, you converge to the equilibrium. So let's look into the brain. I promised you a tour. So we look in the brain, we put you in the scanner, and then we let you do this experiment. I mean, we need to change a little bit the design. And then we indeed see on the left, uh, not much. These are people who choose 33. Um, and on the right, these are people who choose 22. I mean, we can separate people according to what they choose. Yeah, and then we can look what how their brain looks like. And I actually can tell you something more. We also let them do calculations. And there's nothing with calculations. And basically, my um, analysis of this is when you just do calculations, you don't activate our main part, which distinguishes us from, monkey, uh, from chimpanzees, the medial prefrontal cortex, which is the theory of mind. Yeah, so that's why I also say that we have to do experiments, because we have to... Uh, think what the others are thinking. If you just do fixed point calculation, you don't think what the others are thinking. You just do math, which you do actually in high school in grade eight. Yeah, fixed points. Yeah. So <coughs> let's go to behavior over time. Things converge. How much time do I have? Okay, good. So things converge, but very differently. If you have 15 players, it converges faster. If you have three players, it converges less fast. So again, heterogeneity according to the parameters you choose. If you choose for thirds times the average, well, you have zero as an equilibrium, but 100 is a stable equilibrium, which is no surprise. We, if you do it with negative numbers, like minus two thirds of the average, that's what Ramon was talking, that's the negative feedback, you converge much faster which is also obvious. Um, well, how about new entrants? You say, oh, we converge eventually, so we can eventually do policy implications. Well, but what is eventually? If you get new entrants, then you will always stay away, like a ball. Yeah? I mean, you always puff the system, and you, you will always be away from equilibrium. So we can show you there are, sometimes you don't get at all to equilibrium. That's a paper by... Um, uh, by Jonah Brands and Vivis. So we have two equilibria here, a sharp curve and a rather flat curve, and the data is just like the flat curve, and this is exactly due to level K. People have a naive understanding, they give best reply. In one model, you are just in equilibrium. In the other model, you need more levels, and so you are forever far away because you can't figure it out. So the naive players actually drive your behavior. So it's not that naive players are always driven out. So as a conclusion, uh, in the language of Confucius, there are three ways to wisdom, and that's maybe more holistic thinking. We have reflection, imitation, and experience. So what I think is great in economics, we really, I mean you, who do models and modeling, this is really what economic economists are best in. They know how to model complex situation in a stylized way. And I think no other social science or natural science can do that. And you even figure out mathematically in a stylized way things like equilibrium, rationality, and efficiency. Yeah, but that's math. Yeah, and it's very important to, for us experimenters, the structure of, of the entire strategy space. Then we as experimenters, we have to understand what in, uh, happens in these models, what the behavior is about, and in the different institutions, so we can do it under, with many players, with few players, with experts, etc. and we see the different effects. And then what is in between, sandwiched in between, that's basically what we have to give our students. We have to give our students both. I mean, just to calculate fixed points is not enough because the brain does not get really completely activated. I mean, they do that at home, of course, but um, maybe they have to also 
get the activation in an experiential way, because then also we can do more complicated models, as Umberto and Gianmarco and I do in our first year of undergrads, f um, first year, first quarter. We always introduce the theory with an experiment, and so they learn more complicated models, like network expert tonalities. I mean, you all know that this is a very difficult model, but we can do it in the first year, and they can understand it. Okay, that's it, and all together, we, can we have to create institutions and mechanisms with a human touch, that's also important. That's what you get out of experiments. I mean, efficiency might be nice, but it's unequal. Um, and we let our students, for example, be two minutes unemployed, so they might never in later in their life be unemployed, but maybe then they feel how it is, and then they might create better institutions and a better world. Okay, that's all what I want to say. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, we now have uh, Manuel Arellano. Okay, it's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, so, um, obviously, if you know me, I, 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 you know that I, I don't have the, the expertise to, to discuss what, what substantive lessons we learned from lab experiments. So rather, I put together some comments about uh, methodology from the perspective of a data-oriented outsider. Um, these, these are intended to help bridge uh, the gap uh, between experimenters and empirical micro and macroeconomists. Of course, one, one lesson I learned uh, after the, 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 the few readings I, I made is that uh, the Barcelona GSE community has formidable strength in the field, thanks to, to the work of uh, Jordi, Rosemary, Ramon, and, 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 and many others. Um, now, I, I have, uh, uh, I think it's six, six comments, but I can, I can shorten them if, uh, if I'm short of time. One, one is that, uh, because uh, experiments are one of the ways we can identify uh, treatment effects. And any evaluation involves a comparison of units who get treatment with units that don't get treatment. And the question is which units best represent the treated units had they not been treated. Um, in, in some sense, every empirical researcher is reporting the result of an experiment. And Harrison and List uh, put it in this way, every researcher who treats a variable as exogenous effectively views their data as coming from an experiment. In an experimental setting, this belief is, is, is built into the design of data collections. In other cases, this belief is based on theory, auxiliary evidence, or, or both. For example, a conditional exogeneity assumption in, as in propensity score matching asserts that all variables that need to be adjusted for are observed by the researcher. In an instrumental variable setting, uh, we allow for unobserved controls as long as some um, variables are independent of potential outcomes. Uh, we know that testing these assumptions uh, is difficult. Partly experimental methods are popular because of their potential for constructing clear-cut counterfactuals. Now, the issue of uh, generalizability of results. Now, the, the, the best way of isolating the causal effect of interest is problem-specific. Now, consider a response function. So Y is an outcome. X is the determinant of interest, and W, all other determinants. For example, in a wage effort study, W uh, will include uh, demographics of participants, market institutions, order of moves, whether or not interactions are one shot, and so on. Uh, but the, the, the point to note here is that, in general, the level of uh, Y response to X depends on the level of W and X. Many lab experiments provided evidence for certain values of W. Um, an important point is that uh, there may be trade-offs 
between the tightness of controls and the relevance of the values of the control variables in, in this uh, kind of uh, uh, general way. Tight control facilitates uh, replicability, one point that uh, uh, Jordi mentioned. But, but the field offers uh, a large uh, range of variations in W, which may be relevant but hard to implement in the lab. So there may be trade-offs. And, 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 and at the end of the day, transporting experimental findings, be on the lab or on the field, to new populations or new environments will require a model. So methodological debates and they decline. Um, you know, uh, uh, a good thing of, of modern economics is, is uh, in my view, the increasing emphasis in substantive findings uh, relative to methodology. And, and the opportunities for complementarities between methodologies are now pretty well understood. But realizing those opportunities requires uh, less segmentation by research style. And in some cases, retraining. We, we need to, as, 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 as research professional researchers, increasingly think more and more about uh, retraining during our careers. You know, the years where you could expect to, to do a productive uh, research career on the basis of your PhD training are, are long gone. Which, which in a way is good. It's uh, more exciting times for economics and social science uh, generally. So let me, let me uh, mention quickly some of these uh, debates uh, that, uh, that, that, that have been with, with us uh, uh, for, for years. One, one debate is, uh, is between experimental and non-experimental evaluation of uh, treatment effects. Um, this, this, uh, this debate uh, was uh, very prominent in the late 1980s. Uh, it was sparked by Bob Lalonde's uh, critique of uh, observational um, evaluations, uh, uh, especially in labor economics. Not, not only in economics, also in, 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 in other areas, uh, non-experimental evaluations uh, have had uh, an impact. Think of Rubin matching methods. I mean, the, 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 the intent there is to make non-experimental data look like experimental data. This, uh, this, this was put forcefully uh, to the test in the context of uh, the evaluation of health effects of smoking. And, and there are notable examples uh, that combine experimental data with theory and or econometric methods. I'll mention a few here, but I won't go into this. Another debate, the role of theory, structural versus non-structural approaches. I was going to write a slide, but I, I just, just uh, thought I would uh, give you a quote. The current state of play in public finance and labor according to David Card. When I started, most projects would have a pretty explicit theoretical front end, and sometimes the best ones could then map that directly into the empirical approach. Then in the 1980s, it became less and less important to have this well-worked-out theoretical framework. In some cases, people were focusing on extremely straightforward questions with much more emphasis on how carefully I identify where the empirical results. But in the last 10 years, there has been a, back, uh, a backlash. And for almost all my PhD students, I really emphasize the importance of uh, having a well-posed theoretical model. You know, at the end of the day, the, the questions why we are really interested come back. You know, we, we, uh, we are reminded that we have not answered uh, the questions uh, we, we were interested in the first place. So, yeah, I think we have learned a lot uh, from the treatment effects uh, revolution, but uh, questions are still there. And uh, we are uh, taking stock and, uh, and, and going back to them. That's, uh, I think, uh, uh, the reason why I felt uh, 
identified myself with, with that quote. L love versus field experiments uh, versus uh, uh, randomized control trials. Uh, the lab, um, yeah, uh, that's uh, this is repeating things that have been said. Provide tight control variation, offering opportunities to control decision environments in ways that are hard to replicate in the field. They are uh, low cost, and they allow exogenous changes in institutions. So they become important in in uh, market design, exchanges, regulations, the whole lot. Lab-like field, lab-like field. Experiments, uh, they differ from uh, lab experiments in that they are conducted with non-student uh, subjects. In, in these experiments, uh, you know, uh, subjects are recruited in the field, uh, field goods are used, and field context as well, all motivated by a search uh, for greater relevance for predicting field behavior, uh, but possibly at the expense of uh, less tight control and, uh, and, and surely, as, uh, as Jordi remind us, reminded us, uh, less uh, replicability. Love-like love field and randomized control trials, uh, another, another debate, maybe. You know. um, my point here is that these debates um, um, are the decline uh, relative to substantive results. But, uh, See, love-like field experiments differ from randomized control trials in, the, in that subjects make decisions that are not necessarily part of their day-to-day decision-making. And they know that uh, they are part of an experiment, or maybe both. The, the, the point I want to make here, and has been made uh, many times, is that, uh, that there may be a strong complementarity between these two in that uh, Love like data help understand mechanisms uh, uh, through which uh, uh, RCT treatment effects operate. An example, suppose an intervention is conducted in which different types of technologies are randomly offered to farmers and then take up studied. Um, risk and time preferences elicited through lab like experiments can be used to test whether take up varies with uh, these aspects. Right. So in an RCT, uh, the, the, the design is not uh, intended uh, usually uh, to, to, to distinguish among factors that uh, impinge on the, on, the, on, the, on the causal effect. You know, but but, but the, the, the emphasis is in, in, in that the design is directly linked to, to actual policies so that uh, in the end, we get what I uh, could call reduced form uh, causal eff treatment effect, which is uh, of policy relevance in itself. But if we want to go into mechanisms, then there is this uh, complementarity. OK, so wh why we have all these debates? Uh, uh, obviously, there is uh, purely scientific aspects uh, to this debate. But there is also what we could term the the political economy of uh, researcher behavior. Researchers compete among themselves uh, for funding. Most of the funding for research comes from public sources. One minute. Hmm. OK. And so I will, I will not tell you about the political economy of of research behavior. But, but let me advertise uh, these papers, Shorf, Heidi, and Wolpin. They provide a formal rationale in the context of war that combines uh, randomized control trials and structural estimation. A very interesting read. So the, the, an, another point that uh, I don't have the time to elaborate in detail, but I think it matters. Experiments as a data production technology for systematic use. See, one of the main purposes of experiments is to measure individual characteristics that are hard to measure in other ways. And, 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 and often we think of experiments in, an, in isolation. 
But, but we, could, uh, you know, we could think of experiments as a build-up of, uh, of a capital of information, of data, and, and use this data in a systematic approach. There are some good examples of this, but probably not, uh, not enough. Uh, experiments on expectations and subjective expectations in macro. This, this relates uh, to what Ramon was talking about. Uh, you know, the, these, these uh, studies uh, that, that Ramon uh, described, they are interested in understanding how agents uh, form expectations. There is uh, a, a, an alternative, very complementary approach based on getting empirical survey data on agent uh, expectations. Uh, this was an area that, that, that Charles Mansky pioneered. And, and, and there has been progress, a lot of progress in, in, in this context, uh, constructing probabilistic subjective expectations. And we have evidence that, uh, that, that uh, uh, this, this activity provides useful information that, that makes sense. Um, I will skip the detail there. The, 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 the particular aspect that I wanted to describe here, because connects with uh, experimental economics, is actually using experiments within surveys to learn about survey measures of expectations, right? And the, the, again, just, just flagging the thing, uh, uh, there is a group of economists at the New York Fact that is doing very interesting work uh, in constructing a subjective uh, expectations about inflation and connecting those expectations uh, with uh, monetary policy analysis and analyzing you know, uh, the nature of those expectations data in relation to outcomes and choices. And that's, that's some detail there. Other experiments within surveys. This connects with uh, what Rosemary was, uh, was saying. Technology is, is very important here. There are lots and lots of interesting new developments thanks to internet technologies for doing experiments within surveys and experiments in the public administration. We, we ought to start thinking about experimenting with the, with the activity of the administration. The, the Nordic countries have, have, have done uh, some interesting experiments that have been, that been analyzed. And finally, just to conclude with this, I, I wanted to, to say a couple of words about ethics in, in economics. See, uh, learned societies like uh, the Econometric Society, the American Economic Association, have discussed uh, the issue of ethical standards for papers that involve experiments on human subjects. Uh, in the US, the, 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 the ground is, is pretty well organized. You know, institutions are required to have a so-called institutional review board on human participants. This is an IRB. This is a committee that has been formally designated to approve, monitor, and review uh, biomedical and behavioral research involving humans. Now, the, the Econometric Society discussed how to deal with experimental papers that come from institutions outside the U.S. that do not require an IRB procedure in the case of Econometrica. Uh, it has been agreed to take the IRB standard as the norm, but implementation is not easy. At the European Economic Association uh, was set up a committee uh, last year to report on practices among economists in Europe in several dimensions. Data collection, data management, ethical issues for randomized controlled trials, ethics for lab experiment. This has not to do you know, with the purity of the, of the research aspects. This, is, uh, this has to do you know, with the profession not wanting to sponsor activity regardless of how useful from a purely uh, research point of view is that has uh, ethical problems. And there has also been some, uh, some discussion of this in the context of, uh, of randomized control ties, but there is a lot more to do there. We are, uh, we are, this is something new for, for us economists uh, uh, relative to the, to, the, to the natural sciences, and we, we, we need to start thinking about this seriously. Thank you. Thank you. So we have some time for uh, questions. Uh, what I suggest is you just you can ask any of the presenters a uh, question that they respond immediately. Before we start, I'm going to ask uh, the three uh, on this side of the table to uh, respond to three statements that uh, uh, Manolo made. One is uh, for Jordi on the portability of experimental results that they eventually will need a model. Do you remember what he said about that? 
it's an experiment. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, so. The second one was on uh, the randomized control trials that these, as opposed to uh, lab or field experiments, are really normal decisions in people's daily lives. Uh, so in that sense, you know, if you get a subsidy for uh, uh, buying food for your child, if the child goes to school, this is something that you take as a normal decision as opposed to a dictatorship game in the lab. And then the third question is in terms of the uh, formation of expe expectations that also in uh, the Mansky type uh, uh, construction of expectations through surveys rather than to experiments, how that uh, 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 kind of opposes to the way uh, we do that in experiments. That's a question for Ramon. While they have time to think about oh. it, let's go to the question of Rosa. Okay, thank you for the talk. Uh, so this is a concern I heard in several places in, in Europe about students that specialize on, PhD students that specialize on experiments f from the very beginning. And what, what they realize is that they, they seem to be less frustrated than students that uh, specialize on other things. Uh, but then have uh, less incentives to maybe invest in learning about econometrics or learning about uh, theory. Uh, so then the concern that uh, was that, well, then they might be have, have uh, problems later on retraining themselves in things that are different from, from experiments. So I would like to know what you think about that. Uh, this is an important question. And um, I think, so we, we, for example, don't have a master in experimental economics. And I think we agree that we don't really want it because you first need to get a really a good um, education in micro, macro, econometrics, statistics. Um, uh, because when you want to ask um, economic questions, typically they are based in these models. I mean, there are some questions like gender where you might not need uh, necessarily the theory, but at that at the stage of your um, PhD education, you need a very sound education, and that's exactly what I said with Confucius. I mean, um, just experimenting without later knowing how to theorize about it and structure it, um, that's not uh, good enough. And I, I am not very much in favor of all these, uh, what happens if uh, the card is blue or red. Um, so um, definitely one should have uh, um, this education, yeah. Even though experiments is fun. I mean, um, what I also think is that Everybody, and also only then you know whether your field is really mature in the undergrad already needs to know what uh, experimental economics is about, field or lab, because once you have a question, you have to look for the right method, and maybe one method is to go into the lab. But, I mean, 30-year-old, 50-year-olds, they all don't know what an experiment really is. They, like, they know it's fun, maybe, but they don't know what it is, and um, so... Yeah, we need um, a very good economic education. I mean, otherwise one can go to other sciences, I mean, other social sciences where this is not necessary. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, feeling is that, you know, these things are very hard to maybe replicate. Should we be creative, for example, tape? I mean, part of the submission of an experimental paper should be a CD that shows what you say to the uh, your your subjects and how you say it, uh, and maybe tape the whole experiment so that others can see and these things matters. At the end of the at the end of the day, this detail seems to matter, and I have a feeling that I mean, field will benefit a lot if there was some more thought about a convergence and a kind of a gold standard how you do these things. I'm not sure if this is easy. Uh, maybe when you tape people, they will do completely different. They, they will behave differently. But I think we should put an effort on you know getting some uh, common standards uh, on the way. This is pure outsider view. Jordi? Yes, well, I, I guess I said experiments is a method, not a methodology, right? So it's a way of doing things. So do we have a methodology? Well, I guess we do, but it's very much evolved just by learning by doing, right? And some things uh, may be actually, actually suboptimal. We are stuck with doing some things in some way, uh, but others make, some, make sense, right? And, and uh, I guess, for instance, I mean, just going to the taping idea that you had, this has been done in the past. And uh, I guess, so let me say the following. Of course, it's nice to have a methodology. There's actually a book owned by these guys in England, Sagden Looms, uh, and two others who have written about this, and they some say interesting things. At the same time, uh, let me put it this way. If results depended on very, very subtle 
methodological point, points, then in a way I don't want to know them, right? Because then it's just an artifact of a very specific uh, situation, right? So uh, we should be we should be more systematic with the methodology. We should uh, write things down. We should check things out. But at the same time, uh, I guess we should. I mean, or for the general public, people should be aware that hopefully many of these things don't matter because they, if they do matter, then life is extremely complicated, right? I mean, let's see if you have a market uh, experiment, uh, will things go to the equilibrium? Well, what we would like is that most often with some variational in the methodology, it goes to the equilibrium. If it only goes to the equilibrium under very specific conditions, then it's uh, then it's somehow less interesting, right? So I guess, as I said, so just repeating, we, the, the ESA methodology, is had, it has evolved in an asystematic way. It's better if it evolved in a more systematic way. Uh, some people have worked on this, and at the same time I want to dispel the idea that every little detail could matter, because if that is true, then science is gone. I mean, well, the kind of science we do is extremely hard, right? So. Um, yeah, this is what I would okay. say. Th thank you. The, the point in the, in the paper by Frank Shore Heidi and Kiln Walpin is, uh, is about a, a context uh, in which uh, you, you, you want to combine experimental data and, uh, and a structural model, a theory. Um, and the, the motivation is what I explained earlier. The experimental data uh, give you the responses for some values of W. And you want to be able to extrapolate uh, beyond the experimental context. Now, one difficulty there when you do that kind of exercise is the problem of uh, data mining in uh, fitting your uh, uh, your, your model to, uh, to, the, to the experimental data that, that you have. And the, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a problem because, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it, uh, it's, it's, it's an impediment to implementing first best uh, Bayesian analysis, if you want to frame it that way. And, 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 what, and what they do is to, to discuss a, a situation where uh, combining the, the experimental approach and the structural model uh, with uh, holding out uh, from the estimation part of the experimental sample allows for external validation. Right? Um, so the, the, uh, the, the reason why I put this uh, slide it was uh, uh, not so much uh, because of uh, this particular paper, uh, which is interesting in itself, but because this mode of thinking you know, about uh, the researcher having a utility function as a researcher that, uh, and, uh, and, the, and, the, and, 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 and fitting well the data, you know, increasing your, your utility somehow, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a way of thinking that may be productive in other contexts um, and general, can be generalized, you know, that's, uh, that was the point. I agree with Jordi, I mean, in that I think that uh, people now have learned quite a lot to do experiments. Uh, I do when just started here Pompeo Fabra, we had the legs and everything, so, and since then, I think people have learned quite a lot. Uh, but it's true that one thing to learn is what I was saying before, is so for what is good to do experiments, and, uh, and that's one part of it. Okay. For example, uh, in macro experiments, one thing we found out is uh, sometimes what we have in our macro models are very complicated problems to solve, like a complete dynamic programming problem with... Actually, it's not very interesting to try to figure out if people are able to solve these problems or not. That's not the issue. However, uh, people are very good at forecasting, okay? 
So one thing we do in a lot of experiments is just simply ask to the forecast and use the forecast to then use the decisions, uh, the optimal decisions according to the forecast. You might agree that uh, that's not, uh, we should also, people have done experiments, okay? People have done experiments whether it's easier to learn, to do the job, or to do the forecast, okay? We have some data on that. But you know, what is interesting here is to see if there is any systematic difference on the way that, uh, how people do things. What do I mean by this? Is the fact that people make mistakes is not a big deal. If those mistakes by the lowest numbers cancel out. Okay, so the average should be not too bad then. What we learn precisely from learning in these experiments and surveys is precisely that in particular in people forecast, there is a lot of autocorrelation in the data of things which just have to do with these positive and negative feedback effects that I was saying. So that means that then it's mistakes of a lot of people tend to aggregate in a particular way. And that's something that we learn. Mistakes about decisions is slightly different. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that one can figure out. And at the end of the story, you want to do with economics. And I think that, uh, yeah, it can be fashions, it goes one way or another, but at the end, you want discipline in the sense of rigor and theory. You want discipline in the sense of data. But also, one thing that actually, to go down to the experiment lab, it also makes you think more precisely about the microstructure. A lot of our models are mute about how people really trade or how people do things. But and in the world, that matters. And when you sit down and try to say, okay, now I'm gonna ask people to do that, and you're gonna have to aggregate the individual decisions, you have to do it physically, okay? And that sort of also is a nice discipline. It makes you think more about our models, how we do things, and so on. And that's why it's so good, for example, for in the micro side, for uh, market design experiments and all these things. So that's uh, why they had a huge impact on these things because now you can do those. Okay, so it's just all it's about. Okay, so just I suggest one more question by Jam, and then we have each quick their quick response. So Jam, go ahead. First, first I, I would like to thank all of you. It, was, it is very interesting uh, for those that we are not that much into the field. Um, one of the things that Rosemary said was that there are some fields like macro where there's still some reluctance uh, to believe in experiments or to use experiments in a, in a more, um, let's say, more often than, than we do right now. One of the things uh, that might be behind that is the fact of the size of these experiments. I would like to know, and I would like to ask you, first, what are the largest lab experiments that have been done, and whether there are results about sites? For example, the same experiment done in a lab with very few subjects, and then done again with higher number of subjects and even more, whether the results vary in a systematic fashion. One of the reasons is because it, there is an appearance that when we try to deal with institution design, as Ramon was saying, or something like this, where there is a strategic behavior among a few agents, it might be very interesting to see how these strategies are done, what agents believe, and so on. In large markets, this might be less of an issue and more of a question of predicting what others do. So can you tell us what, mm -hmm. what have we learned about size through lab experience? Okay, um, so I can actually start with um, introduction to economics with experiments. I mean, we all know the virus equilibrium, we know demands and supply, and we know how many people we need in theory. How many do we need? Three. Wait, don't, that's your <laughs> answer. How many do we need? A continuum, right, that's a lot, yeah? <laughs> right. I mean, he already gave another the lab answer. Yeah. So the the surprising part was, I mean, and uh, so Vernon Smith um, was in Chamberlain's experiment about this market, uh, the the auction market. Yeah. And uh, of course, as Ramon said, the the, uh, the uh, uh, equating demand and supply doesn't say how it how it has to happen. Yeah, so Chamberlain that uh, the students walk around and they should uh, somewhere buy us, one, somewhere sell us, they know their values and their costs, and then they could trade. And he sees there it doesn't converge. Yeah, as uh, Vern Smith was in 
his class. And uh, 10 years later, it took him 10 years somehow, um, about 10 years, he, he thought about it and he said, well, I'm going to construct a good trading market and let's see what's happening then. And that's the double oil auction for which he actually got the Nobel Prize. And in fact, you don't need many. You need maybe three. I mean, you need two types. Or I mean, in my class, there are maybe 10 on one side and 10 on the other. And 10 for you is a small number, I guess. For us, it's a pretty big number. We have only 20 computers, yeah? But we get convergence. We get fast convergence, I mean, with this double oral auction, but also when the, our students trade and they don't have double oral auction, but they still do it in the Chamberlain way. So this is one answer. Um, we know that two is very different from three. So we have done an experiment together, um, Jaume and I, and, um, well, uh, we thought about how many, and then we said, okay, five. Okay, five is for us many, yeah, and everything worked very beautifully. So we got convergence, and two is little. Um, no, oh, one, one player was, one was a monopolist, and we got the monopolist uh, um, outcome, and with two, we get slower convergence, yeah? But, I mean, we can definitely say in many um, occasions, in coordination games, yeah? If you have two players, that works pretty nice. With three, you get sometimes coordination, sometimes not. And with 10, definitely is a mess. Yeah, so um, I have done my experiments with 2,000. Yeah, we get the nice structure. We get exactly in the lab with 15 or with 10. Yeah, so it's not a size problem. But, I mean, you have to give me the specific problem you have I mean, that's what Jordi said, it's all empirical, and then we can tell whether three is enough or we need a continuum. I mean, continuum is difficult, but with the web nowadays we can do thousands, and I mean, you can have, you have public good experiments with 100 players, and maybe the convergence is slower to the free riding, yeah. But, I mean, we need to talk about specific cases in order to make uh, the true conclusion. Yeah. Jordi also wanted to comment yeah. on, yeah. on size. Yeah. Rosie says size does not matter. No, yeah. that, I didn't <laughs> say that. No, 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 no. <laughs> so I agree, of course, with Rosie that for the convergence to Valrasian outcome in the double auctions, uh, the, num the size is not important. But I think in general, size is one of the most important problems. So, uh, well, I said two. Wait, wait, wait. So. <laughs> I have uh, worked with uh, computer scientists who do simulations, right? And and I always and then and we've discussed, right? And I've told them in the end, you know, an experiment is always better than a simulation. The only thing that's better with simulation is you can have as many agents as you want, and you can as have as many periods as you want. So how can one really do an experiment with a lot of people? It's hard because there's the simultaneous. T I mean, there's the the lab issue, or you could of course do it with different labs different labs at the same time, connect people. And, and that requires a lot of effort. And some people have done things like that. I don't remember now yeah. the, uh, the largest one. So, but not so much has been done. So some people has, have done something like that. Yeah, maybe 100, because there, there's a public good game with 100 players. But it was not done simultaneously. I mean, you could log on to the computer during a certain time, and then they somehow <laughs> added this. So we have a little paper called Size Doesn't Matter, which is, uh, and it's about um, markets uh, for gift exchange, and we went from markets in which we had seven players to markets where we had 21 players, right? So that we could do because we once were in Brazil and there was this large uh, lab. So I think it's an issue, and I, you know, maybe we should uh, come up with some scheme to get different labs together, but then I agree with Rosie on an interesting issue, and it's something that you really want to know, not just check out size for, it by its, for its own matter, own sake, right? But something that depends on size according to your expectation. Maybe we should just check out by working together with other labs, and I don't know, we could maybe get 200 people together, you know? We can not get 20,000 together, so. <laughs> maybe okay. we could, yeah. So I I committed to three answers. I'm going to ask each of you to have a 10-second answer to my question. I'm going to repeat the question which was coming out of uh, 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 Manolo's uh, presentation. Uh, portability of experimental, experimental results needs a model. 10 seconds. Oh, oh can I have a little more in my seconds? Yes. Okay. So Look, there's all lights out there. They're all bars. Okay. We, so it's Friday three th night. So. Three things about portability. It's a very important issue, and I also like that Manuel used the word generalizability on that because usually the term that I use is external versus internal 
uh, validity for experiments, but three things about it. First, portability of results is also an issue with observational data. If you have a study about collusion in the car industry in Norway, what does it say about the cement industry in Portugal? Right? So you cannot go from one case to the other. You, uh, second, um, you have to look at portability as an issue of degree and not zero one. So uh, w think of the following example. If you want to know something about the behavior of consumers in Norway, really real consumers, right? And you can do an experiment in the lab in Norway, right, with people from there. And that's the kind of information you can have. The other type of information you can have is information from consumers, real consumers in Kenya, right? Then just think of it. It's not obvious that the information from real consumers in Kenya is going to be more useful to understand real consumers in Norway than a lab experiment in Norway for real consumers in Norway, right? So I guess the more general point is portability is a general problem. It's not only of experiments. And with respect to the data from experiments, one should, of course, be, can be especially skeptical. But one has to also consider this thing, that there's like different dimensions of, diff of, you know, of portability. And that, that may be very important. And I think I want to, oh, the last thing, theory. Do we need a theory? I mean, it's one of these things that we always say, you know, to have portability, we need a theory, but it may just not be possible. It may just not be possible. I mean, I, I, you can always say it may not be possible, but we should try to have a theory. Yeah, I, of course, you know, why not? But, uh, you know, thinking that the, there will be a portability through theory is uh, not knowing all the issues. For instance, the, something that's very fashionable now is gender studies, right? So is going, is, how people behave, the gender pro gender differences in, in one environment and in an other environment, are we going to build a model that will encompass all this? I don't know. I mean, a theory, an, a, an economic theory model, I don't know. I have no clue. Maybe there can be a biological, neuro, uh, neurological model of that, but maybe not, right? So, of course, it's nice to think that theory should be the way to have portability, but it may not be possible. Okay, thank you, Jordi. Sorry, uh, no. Rosie, uh, uh, please, shorter 10 seconds. Uh, RCTs are about normal decisions from daily life as opposed to experiments and uh, field and lab. Should, should, um, repeat, should we the, do the, the, No, the, the, the point was randomized control trials, RCTs, are really about normal decisions from daily life as opposed to the decisions that people make in lab or field. Well, in randomized um, tri control trials, I mean, there are daily life decisions like should I use a mosquito net or not, and probably this you should really do in the field. So what I tell my students and also my colleagues, um, you should first ask your question, uh, you should tell me your question, then we should uh, see the right methods. Of course, eventually we will only want to have questions about the real life. What do we do with in the real life? I mean, do incentive matter? Does it matter whether I get a mosquito net for free or I have to pay for that? Yeah. So basically, if you have observational data, if you can do a field experiment, do it. But maybe you have questions in these field experiments which you can't uh, answer with the field because it's too uncontrolled. Then maybe try to answer that in the field, uh, in the lab. So I give you an uh, observational data, eBay auction or uh, Amazon.com auction. They have two uh, different ending rules and th um, the behavior is very different. So does this depend on the experts or does it depend on the people who are non-experts? You can maybe not so well study that in the lab, uh, in the field, but you can then come to the field, uh, to the, sorry, to the field and make people experts or not, and then see the differences. Yeah, so it depends on the question whether this okay. is, um, Thank what you. is the best method. And the last point was the one for, uh, 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 on constructing expectations, a la Mansky for uh, uh, the president. I'm not the hat of the president now. <laughs> uh, I want to say something about the first question, actually, so. <laughs> <laughs> You have 10 seconds. Okay, almost five seconds in each. Uh, very quick. I already said before that we want to understand more this mapping from the perceived law of motion to the actual law of motion. And in a sense, one can think about the experimental lab also helping to do that. In what? If that precisely there are things that they may be not generalized. And there are experiments done of that, not in macro so much. But for example, experiments looking at 
systematically trying to figure out why the north and the south of Italy is different. And what people seem to be more different is about uh, likelihood to cooperate. So you can play cooperative games. And this seems like the, for some reason you are in a particular environment and then you perceive that the, the same rule, the same things come out to different outcomes. So that's an experiment which precisely says that uh, we should not expect the same result everywhere because we have firm expectations based on the way we had done things all the time. Okay, so, and this is also then relates actually to the question of the survey, and I think that's a very interesting research. And for example, the paper I mentioned of Albert and, all, and Klaus and all, this is just theory doing with the computer, but they basically look at very precisely in the issue about uh, survey expectations though. And what is interesting precisely to find out that the patterns are very the same. That's what that I said, because that gives us a strength. And it's very good to do this kind of work that Mentier and others have been doing relating both things. But there is something that uh, you cannot do with the survey. You know that the people, for example, in uh, asset markets, those are people trading the huge amount of money. So that's not peanuts. That is a huge thing. So what happens? What then we have in the lab is we can really control the general equilibrium effects of a little model. And if we can do that, the general equilibrium effects, we get something that feel experiments are not very good, okay, because I'm a partial equilibrium most of the time. So if we can do that, and we also, the same, we see that the, the behavior we see on the data has the same features. Of course, in the lab we have no long time series, but, uh, but we, enough to get that we get the same. So that's, I think, the way it is. So they complement. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think we had an exciting debate about or experiment uh, with experts. They were not uh, students, so we got, we got uh, uh, highly uh, uh, a lot of expertise here. I just want to thank you all for staying until now, for uh, 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 joining in the Trovala. I don't know whether uh, uh, Nessie wants to say something else, so that's basically the end of it. Before you stand up and take a look at the beautiful view. Let's just thank the four speakers uh, for the uh, round table. Thank you very much. Thank you.